Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for coming tonight. I want to thank Sekiya-san and the Japan Society and the Talks Plus program for having me here tonight and for the Sake Export Association for welcoming me to be the speaker for this evening. So can I see by a show of hands how many people have been to this annual sake tasting before? OK, that's almost everybody. So. Um, as Sekiya-san mentioned, this is the 22nd year that this program has been running. And if you've been to this program before, as most of you had, you may have been expecting to see Mr. John Gauntner standing up here. Uh, he's been the lecturer for the last 21 years. And I would really be remiss if I didn't start my remarks by thanking John. And uh, he is here tonight with us. So just a round of applause for John. Thank you for 21 years of uh, amazing lectures. John has been my teacher for over a decade and the teacher for almost everybody in the sake community. So uh, it's a real honor and a privilege to be asked to uh, step in for this 22nd year of this lecture. So today we have a really fun topic. We're going to be talking about sake vessels, drinking vessels in sake. And, you know, I thought a lot about how to arrange this lecture and I decided to focus on five classic sake vessels that you're gonna see again and again and again. And then to contrast that by five classic materials for making these vessels. So we're gonna look first at the five classic vessel shapes. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the style of each of those. And then we're gonna get into the different materials that can be used to make these vessels. I've brought some samples up here as well, which I'm going to uh, hold up and demonstrate a bit, but we'll have pictures so you can see in the slideshow as well. Now the first vessel we're gonna talk about is called a masu. You may have seen this in Japanese restaurants. This is uh, usually made out of wood. It's a box, and this box was originally a measuring cup. And uh, in Japan, so uh, rice used to be a form of payment, and you needed something to measure, so they would use this wooden box to measure um, rice, soy sauce, and different things. Uh, this box is very, very sturdy, and there were lots and lots of them hanging around, and over the years it morphed into a drinking cup. Now, the size of this masu is very important as well. The standard masu is 180 ml, about six ounces, and in Japan that's called, that, that volume of liquid is called a go. And when you order sake in Japan, you very often order by one go, or two go, or three goes. And I don't know if you've ever noticed, but the bottle sizes in Japan are different from the bottle sizes in Europe. If you go buy a bottle of sake, it's 270 ml. And in Europe, wine bottles are 750 ml. And what's the discrepancy here? Well, the difference all stems from this masu, from this wooden box. Starting at 180 ml, 720 is four go, or four servings from this box. So, uh, and the, the 1.8 liter bottle, you've probably seen those Magnum party size bottles, the 1.8, those are 10 of these 10 go in there. So uh, the masu has been a very important symbol of the sake industry for a long time. And one place you often see masu being used is at a kagami biraki ceremony. I don't know if you've ever seen that, but they have a sake barrel, and they take mallets and they smash open the barrel. And then the sake that's in the barrel is then shared with the group, and everyone's given a wooden masu to receive the sake from. And that is a way of sharing the prosperity or the good fortune of event, such as a wedding or a, an opening of some kind, sharing all the prosperity of that event with the group. So that's where you often see a masu. And masu can be made from various materials, which we're going to look at in a minute. The next sake vessel we're going to look at is called a sakazuki. Sakazuki is a shallow and footed traditional and ceremonial sake cup. These sakazuki only hold one to two sips of sake. They're not meant for large volume of consumption. And because they're so low, it requires two hands to hold them stable. So these cups are designed for drinking of sake where intent is really important, 
where purpose is really important. And they've become to be used mostly at wedding ceremonies and at different ceremonial occasions when the study of what you're drinking and the focus of what you're doing is really important. Uh, another time when you often see sakazuki is at uh, New Year's sake drinking, New Year's celebrations of drinking sake on New Year's. Moving on to the next type of cup, we have the ochoko. Now, if you've ever had sake before, chances are you've seen an ochoko. Ochoko is the most common type of sake cup. It tends to be a little bit on the small side and it tends to have smooth sides. It's a small cup and it comes in many different materials. You can see it in a ceramic, porcelain, glass, etc. I would say this is the type of sake cup that most people would identify with what they would think of as a sake cup if they were asked on the street. Now, the sake cup is quite small. And sometimes people ask me when I do lectures or events, why are sake cups so small? And there's actually a couple reasons for that. The first one, if you've ever been to Japan, you may have heard that it's impolite to pour sake for yourself. You're always supposed to pour sake for the other person you're with. And in Japan, this, this mini ceremony of pouring for the other person and then receiving is actually a, a, what I would call like a social icebreaker. It allows people to interact with each other when if you're at a table you may not know the other people, one thing you can do to break the ice is to offer to pour for them and keep an eye on everyone's cup and make sure everyone, pouring back and forth is a way to engage social interaction. When that cup is smaller, you can have more of that engagement going. The other reason that these ochoko are sometimes small is that when you have warm sake, you wanna keep that sake at temperature. So having just a few sips and then refilling and another few sips, that type of a smaller cup can be a good way to keep the sake at the ideal temperature. Now the next sake vessel we're gonna look at is called a guinomi. Now I couldn't find any clear legal definition of what a guinomi is, but it tends to be defined as something larger than an ochoko and generally more rough hewn or more casual in feeling than an ochoko. Now the name guinomi is interesting uh, it stems a little bit from onomatopoeia or these sound words such as vroom vroom or moo moo. Uh, gooey gooey is uh, in Japan can be translated as gulp gulp and anomi is a word for drink. So drinking with gulps is uh, one of the more literal translations of this style of, of larger uh, sake cup. Very often guinomi tend to be made from uh, uh, ceramics that have a little bit of a rougher edge to them or a little bit of a wavy edge to them. They're um, very often collected as art objects as well. And the final vessel we're going to look at is called a tokuri. This is a very standard looking sake carafe that you see here. And tokuri is also an onomatopoeia. Toku toku Toku, 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 toku. <laughs> that is, um, means glug, 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 glug. So uh, that's where this name tokuri comes from. And it's the pouring motion that creates that sound. Um, you'll notice that it has a slender body and a narrow neck. Now this tokuri is not always used for warming, but when it is used for warming, that narrow neck helps retain heat inside the carafe. So that's a uh, purpose of that shape. And then the lip is gently curved to allow for pouring and smooth pouring of, out of the uh, tokuri. Okay, so those are the five vessels that we're gonna be looking at today. And now I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the materials that you often see being used. And I also picked five primary materials. And we're, we're gonna look at those materials and then I'm gonna show you some examples of each of these styles represented using different materials. So the material types we're gonna look at are wood, lacquer, ceramic, metal, 
and glass. So let's start right at the top and get started with wood. Now, there's two main types of wood in Japan that are used to craft different sake vessels. The first one is the more expensive of the two, and that is called hinoki wood. It's often translated as Japanese cypress. This type of wood ha has essential oils that give it a very distinct aroma, and this wood is well known for being very heavy and strong and solid and is often used not just for making uh, the finest wooden sake vessels, but also used for building shrines and buildings as well. An alternate type of wood that can be used for making sake vessels is called sugi. This is often translated as Japanese cedar, but I learned through my research that it's actually a relative of the redwood tree. It's also a very fragrant wood, fragrant, um, wood and tends to be more affordable than the hinoki. So between these two woods, let's see what type of vessels um, you can make out of these. The first one is the standard masu. And there's a few unique things about masu. The majority of masu made in Japan actually come out of Gifu Prefecture. And the structure of the masu is made using joints only. There are no nails used at all in creating these liquid uh, proof, uh, no drip masu. Many, many sizes are available, and they often correlate with that go system. So one go, two go, three goes, based on 180 ml. I brought a sample of a masu with me today. This is um, the standard shape and size. But the one I brought has a little special feature. There's a uh, lips, <laughs> lips marked on here to show you where you're supposed to drink. Some people try to drink from the center. That never works out very well. Uh, you're supposed to drink from the corner. Um, and this is, uh, this is a masu that is made in Gifu Prefecture. And I thought it was really amusing, so I wanted to bring this along to show you guys today. So this is a classic example of a wooden masu. But there are other types of drinking vessels made out of wood. Another very famous wood comes out of Akita Prefecture. This is called uh, Magewapa crafting. And what they do is they take very thin sheets of sugi, uh, Akita sugi wood, and they line up the grain to create lines around the object. I would say this crafting is most well known for making bento boxes with lids, but they also do make sake vessels as well. Here you can see a picture of a very beautiful ochoko that's been crafted out of this sugi wood. They are very, very lightweight, and again, they emphasize the design of the grain. Another wooden uh, type of vessel is, we're going back to the sakazuki. So this is that low ceremonial cup, and I found an example that was made also out of Akita sugi. Again, these are meant for just a few sips of sake, a very studious moment using two hands, very often ceremonial purposes. <clears throat> and finally, I also found a guinomi. So compared to the ochoko, which had the straighter sides and was a little bit smaller, guinomi tend to be a little bit larger for gulp, 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 for gulping, and they tend to have an uneven edge of some sort. And this has a lip that has a little bit of an uneven edge to it. Okay, so that's what we have for wood. Now I'm gonna be moving on to lacquer. Now lacquer is one of the uh, oldest of these materials that I've found being used in Japan. Uh, the first use of lacquerware is dated to over 7,000 years ago in Japan. Lacquer is a decorative and protective coating that goes on to all types of objects and for uh, sake service wear as well. It's actually uh, made from processing the sap of the urushi tree. Uh, in a world before plastics, imagine with me a world before we had any plastics available at all, lacquer almost seemed like a miracle product. It was extremely durable. Uh, it had tremendous beauty. It had a very, very soft texture to it, and it was heat resistant. Uh, it was almost a miracle product, and it, it is something that is extremely beautiful. Lacquer is most often put over a very, very thinly carved wooden base. 
and applied in many, many, many layers. It takes a long time to make a lacquer object because the lacquer is applied in many layers and between each layer, the object must be dried at a very specific humidity for quite a while. So to get the lacquer built up over many layers, it does take a long time. So one of the most, when people think of lacquer sake wear, one of the very first things they think of is a ceremonial sakazuki. I brought an authentic lacquer sakazuki here. And when you pick up a lacquer object for the first time, one of the things you notice right away is how light it is. Underneath the layers of lacquer, there is almost a paper thin shell of wood under here. And even if this were made of plastic, if you were to pick it up, it would be heavier than the, than the weight of this is now. And you get a tremendous polish and shine from, uh, from a lacquer wear. It's very, very soft and silky to the touch and um, brings a tremendous elegance to using sakazuki. Now this one and many sakazuki have a decoration. Um, this is called uh, makie, and this is a type of well-known lacquer decoration. It literally means sprinkled picture, and what they do is they take metallic powder, either gold or silver, and they create uh, designs by sprinkling the powder onto wet lacquer and creating beautiful designs. Lacquer can also be built up and carved, and you can also use embedded elements, uh, such as seashells or different uh, decorative things you can also embed in lacquer. <clears throat> Here is a guinomi that's made out of lacquer. Uh, this is from Joboji Urushi out of Iwate, Japan. And I have this same one right here. And this is polished to a little bit more of a matte finish. But again, the feel of this is very, very soft and silky and very, very lightweight. Absolutely beautiful. The more you use it, the more you touch it, the more wear you get on the lacquer, it becomes uh, polished and uh, very, very soft to the touch. So these items are really meant to be used and to be handled. They're absolutely beautiful. And, and uh, this is an example of a larger size guinomi. So now we're going to move on to ceramic. And I had to do a little research into this myself. The world of ceramics has many layers. And uh, the word pottery and ceramic can be interchanged a bit. But I found three main levels of ceramic that could impact sake serving vessels. The first one is earthenware. This is the least um, expensive and is made out of an unrefined clay heated to the lowest temperature about 1,915 degrees Fahrenheit. This produces an object that is more porous, and if it were to be used for any type of service wear, it would have to be completely glazed. Uh, terracotta is an example of this. So if you have terracotta uh, planters at home, you know how they absorb a little bit of water. They're very porous. Where we see more sake vessels actually being used is with stoneware. Now, stoneware also uses unrefined clay, but it has more sand in it. It gets heated to a higher temperature, around 2,185 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, what the resulting um, stoneware is quite hard, very chip resistant, very durable. Uh, the glaze may have a grittier texture because of the sand, and it is more expensive than earthenware. And the last type of ceramic is porcelain. Now porcelain is made using a refined clay, a white clay, and this is heated to the highest temperature of all, 2,300 degrees Fahrenheit. This creates a smooth, white, non-stick, very, very thin, non-porous material. You can get translucence with porcelain, and this creates the thinnest of all the ceramics. So a very classic example of ceramic is the uh, ochoco, uh, this is a porcelain ochoco, and I have this one here. Um, you can see inside there's a blue and white ring design, almost like a bullseye design. Uh, in Japan, this is called a janome, or snake eye. And this was used, this is this symbol, this blue uh, bullseye symbol is actually a, has become a symbol for the sake industry itself. 
This is used to evaluate the clarity of a sake. So when you look down into the cup with this bullseye at the bottom, you can see the clear de delineation between the dark blue and the white and assess for yourself how clear or how hazy the sake is. Uh, this is a standard size uh, sake cup for Ochoco. And I also have the one go size. So this is the 180 ml. And this size is used for evaluations at sake breweries. Um, and if you go to a uh, sake tasting competition, very often they will have sake served in this. So this is more or less considered like an official sake tasting cup. And again, it's porcelain, very smooth, non-porous, and very thin sides. But you can see that very famous uh, Jean Nome bullseye design. Now, another thing we have that is um, in ceramic is the tokuri. And I have an example of a ceramic tokuri here. This is Arita porcelain. So that is from Saga Prefecture, and that's probably one of the most famous porcelains in Japan. Uh, again, you have white, non-porous, very, very thin uh, porcelain, and this heats and retains heat beautifully. Um, we also uh, can move on to a different type of ceramic besides porcelain. We can talk about bizenware. So bizen is actually a type of earthenware. Uh, this is not glazed, but it reaches a hardness where it can still be non-porous. Uh, you get a reddish brown coloring with bizenware, and it is fired using red pine wood. Uh, these objects are from Okayama Prefecture. And here's an example of a uh, tokuri using the uh, ceramic called a bizen. And finally, we have uh, Kutani porcelain. This is another very, very famous porcelain out of Ishikawa Prefecture. Now let's move on to uh, metal. This is an example of a sterling silver sakazuki. So again, back to the ceremonial cup. Um, metals that are used in Japan, gold, silver, tin, and copper are also quite common. Here's an example of a sterling silver sake carafe. And here is a beautiful example of a tin, tokuri and ochoko. Now I can tell that this was designed specifically for warm sake. And I can tell that because the neck of the tokuri has some rush wrapped around it. So you can hold the tokuri without touching the hot metal. If you see these, these tin carafes without that, or without a handle on them, very often they're meant for cold sake. One of the key points with metal is that they are very, very durable, of course, but they also retain heat and cold tremendously well. So if you chill a metal ochoko or guinomi, it's gonna retain that cold. And if you uh, use it to heat a sake as well, it's gonna retain that heat very well. So that's one of the great advantages to metal sake vessels. And then we're gonna look at, lastly, at glass. One of the most famous glassworks in Japan, um, the type of glass is called Edo Kiriko. Kiriko means faceted or cut glass. Uh, this type of colored glass was established during the middle to the end of the Edo period. And it's a two layer glass where they blow clear glass on the inside and a colored glass on the outside. You often see blue or red colors. They are layered together and then fo formed into a shape and then cut. Here you can see a uh, ochoko and a tokuri side by side. And of course, these are meant more for chilled sake or cold sake. The next slide I have here is a very classic, a very inexpensive example of a glass standard tokuri and uh, ochoko. And again, these are great for chilled sake. And not only that, we also have masu that are made out of glass. Um, so you can uh, have a mixture and combination of these materials, and even if it's not as traditional, it can be absolutely wonderful to enjoy. Now, sake tasting is not always that serious. So I'm gonna introduce some drinking vessels that are all about fun and games. So 
When I first started getting into sake, maybe uh, 14 years ago now, I had a really wonderful sake experience here in New York at a sushi restaurant, and I said, I'm a sake fan now. So I have to go out and I have to get a sake cup and I have to get a sake carafe. And I went to an Asian gift shop down on Canal Street and I found a green green uh, ochoko and a matching tokuri and the two of them together were under $10 and I thought, yeah, I'm all set for the rest of my life. I've got my sake cup. This is exactly how you have to drink it. And after a few more months, I realized that I went to my first high-end sake bar here in New York. And that experience kind of changed my perception of sake vessels for a long time. They brought out a wooden uh, bucket with ice and flowers, and then there was a beautiful glass sake carafe nestled in the ice, and the cups were also chilling. And the cups were very delicate and very fine. And just picking up the cup, changed my perspective completely about consuming the sake. Regardless of how good or poor the sake was, the presentation really added to the experience. And uh, I think that's one of the key points from tonight is that whatever materials you choose and whatever, um, whatever form you choose, uh, I really hope that these add to your enjoyment of the sake. So, when I discovered some of these more fun and playful sake cups, this really got me interested in collecting. And my closet now is quite full with many of these. So the first one is really funny. This is uh, called a magic eye cup. I don't know if you've ever seen this before, uh, but this is a type of cup with like a marble at the bottom. And when you look down into the cup with nothing in it, you see a, a marble, you can't see anything. But when you pour liquid, it creates like uh, glasses or it creates a refraction that allows you to see through to the bottom of the cup. And here on the right, you can see a lady's face. And as you can imagine, there's some of these cups that are, let's say, R-rated, um, <laughs> that have uh, some more salacious scenes to them. So I tried to find the least, most tame, tame one that I could. So we have a geisha from the shoulders up, but there are some other ones, trust me. Uh, these, these come in all different shapes and sizes, and uh, I'm sure these were very fun to enjoy sake out of. The next one is called bekuhai cups. So these are cups with a hole in them, and you have to plug it with your finger while you're drinking, and you're not allowed to put it down, or of course the sake is going to run out. This is a way to force people to drink up. There's a related type of bekuhai cup called the what I call the weeble wobble cup, which doesn't have a foot. So if you put it put it down, it's going to fall over. So again, if it's full, you have to drink it before you can set it down. In Kochi, they make a game out of this um, called the bekuhai, where they spin a, what looks like a dreidel. They spin this little dreidel and they sing a song and they said, the song is basically the meaning is, okay, God of sake, we want you to point to the most beautiful woman. And then whoever it points to, they have to drink. And the dreidel has different uh, images on the side of it. And if it is the tengu or the, the long nosed goblin, that's the largest cup. And again, you cannot set it down without everything spilling over. And the medium sized cup has a hole in the bottom. So uh, this is a really fun drinking game if you ever get a chance to play it. Um, I also received once as a gift a very beautiful lacquer, uh, high-end lacquer drinking game. It has a dice and you roll the dice and whatever number comes up, you have to drink the cup with that number in it. So you could be lucky and get the six or you could get the one. And uh, this makes a lot of fun very quickly. Yeah. Okay. And one of my most favorite um, things that I've discovered is the uh, uguisu tokuri. So this is what we would call a chirping carafe. And uguisu is often translated as nightingale, but it's really a bush warbler in Japan. And I have one here, and I'm going to demonstrate it for you now. So there's a little hole right under the bird here and it creates a little vacuum and whistles. And when you, and when you pour it, <laughs> it makes a noise, so that's really fun. 
And the final, uh, the final fun and games cup that I'm going to show you is actually a whistling sake cup. And this is actually a set with the chirping tokuri. And you can see there's a little straw-like protrusion on the side, and there's a hole on the bottom. And normally when you have a whistle, what do you do? You have to put it in your mouth and you blow. But because we're sipping sake, this whistle works by breathing in. And I shall demonstrate now. So if you imagine a world before uh, iPhones and Instagram, this was probably a laugh riot for hundreds of years. <laughs> so uh, that, is the, that brings us to the conclusion of my introduction to sake vessels. I want to thank you all so much for uh, coming tonight. Now, what we're really here to do is have a wonderful sake tasting. And I'm going to be introducing the sake uh, producers to you now who are going to be pouring sake for you this evening. So I would invite them to come up on stage and I'm gonna introduce each one of them to you. And then they're gonna go and get ready for the tasting and we're gonna excuse them. After they leave, we're gonna have a little bit of a Q&A time. Okay, all right. So, starting on my left, from Akita Seishu, out of Akita Prefecture, we have Shohei Kuromasa. From Nambu Bijin Brewery, out of Iwate, we have Chizuko Nikawa. Uh, Uchigasaki Shuzoten, out of Miyagi, we have Chie Uchigasaki. From Kaetsu Sake Brewing Company out of Niigata, we have Dr. Kunichi Sato. From Okunomatsu Sake Brewing out of Fukushima, we have Yoji Yusa. From Tentaka Brewing Company out of Tochigi, we have Mamoru Shiga. Um, from Mioya Shuzo out of Ishikawa, we have Miho Fujita-san. <clears throat> from Nambu Shuzo Jo out of Fukui, we have Takuya Nambu. Representing Imada Sake Brewery out of Hiroshima, we have Kaoru Ishiguro. For Rihaku Sake Brewing Company out of Shimane, we have Yuichiro Tanaka. <laughs> Representing Asahi Sake Brewing out of Yamaguchi, we have Mai Mizuno. <laughs> Representing Tenzan Sake Brewery out of Saga, we have Takuya Shimomura. <laughs> Representing Chiyo Chiyo Sono Brewery, out of Kumamoto, we have Yuri Honda. And last but not least, uh, representing Brooklyn Kura from Brooklyn. It is, it's Brian, Brian Poland. All right, thank you all. So they're gonna exit the stage and they're gonna go get ready and set up our tasting. So thank you all guys so much. We're looking forward to tasting your sake. Okay, so if you've had some time to think of some questions, we're gonna take, take about 10 or 15 minutes to answer questions that you have. And the brewers are going to set up their tables and get the sake ready for us to enjoy. Are they, are they gonna have microphones? Yeah. Okay, so I would say if you have a question about sake, about sake vessels, um, and you want to have me try to answer your question, um, the staff is gonna come around with a microphone on either side. So if you'd like to have a question answered, 
please raise your hand. Let's start right here in the front. So raise your hand. <clears throat> All right. Hello. Thank you for a very nice lecture first. Uh, small question. What about the hot sake and cold sake? Mm. Is it different occasions, different traditions associated with this? Can you tell us a little more about this? Absolutely. So I often get asked, which sake should I drink cold? Which sake should I drink hot? And to make it a really quick answer, I usually say, look at the aroma of the sake. The more aromatic, fruity, and floral the aroma is, the less likely it is that you're going to want to warm up that sake. Those uh, ginjo or floral fruity aromas are the first to evaporate and disappear when you bring up the temperature in a sake. However, there's plenty of totally delicious sakes that have more of a ricey aroma or more restrained aroma. Those can be wonderful when you serve them warm. So that's the first thing really quickly that I say is just look at the aroma. Um, the other thing I like to say on this topic is that Warm sake is absolutely delicious, and I think there's a bit of a misunderstanding that hot sake is cheap sake or hot sake is bad sake. Nothing could be further from the truth. I worked for one year at a sake brewery in Niigata making sake, and once a month, the staff at the brewery would kind of let us out of our cages and we could go have a drinking party once a week with all the brewers and let off some steam. So I was actually drinking with the people actually making the sake. And in the middle of the winter, they were all enjoying their sake warm. And the people who were making it were actually drinking it that way. So it's an absolutely, totally legit way to enjoy sake. You just have to find the right style for the right temperature. Here. I've noticed in uh, reading through this that various, uh, uh, say, I know Junmai Daiginjo or Junmai Ginjo, but they have before them some words I have never seen before. Uh, just as an example, at table number 10, uh, they always say Rihaku first. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are others that are here that mm -hmm. refer to some other words before. I've never yeah. seen that. Could you perhaps explain what those mean? Sure. In the case of Rihaku, that's the brand name. Oh. Yep. So um, very often they're going to have the brand name Nambu Bijin Umeshu. Nambu Bijin Jinmai Daiginjo. Yep. So that's the... Yeah. The first thing to show up in each of these is the brand name. Yep. Okay, let's take a question from over here. Anybody on this side have a question? No? Oh, right here. Okay, there we go. This gentleman. <clears throat> uh, yes, I was just wondering what the process of uh, going to become a sake samurai is like. <laughs> if you could answer that really quickly. Thank you. And that well, was a wonderful lecture, by oh, the way. Oh, thank you so much. I was very honored to become a sake samurai back in 2007. And John Gauntner, who was doing this lecture for 21 years, became sake samurai, the very first sake samurai, the year before me. So he's my senpai, my sensei in all ways. Um, basically, I, I, I believe the process is that you are nominated by the industry for the Japan Sake Brewers Association. And it's an award given out by the Brewers Association to recognize people around the world, inside and outside of Japan, who are doing work to promote the sake industry. And what I was doing back in 2007 was I was running one of the few English language sake websites here in the United States called Urban Sake, which I still maintain today. So I was, um, back when there was no Facebook and no Instagram, I was blogging about sake, and that's how I was lucky enough to become a sake samurai. Okay, how about right here? Yes. <clears throat> I was wondering if the vessel, what it's made out of, ceramic or metal, if that affects the um, taste of the sake. Does it change the taste? That's, that's a wonderful question. Um, and in many ways, I think it's almost a philosophical question. If you drink the best red wine you've ever had in your life out of a Dixie cup or out of you know, a $1,000 crystal goblet, it's the same wine, but the experience is totally different. And I think, honestly, we would have a different perception of that wine consumed in those two different ways, and it's the same for sake. I think that one thing you want to pay attention to when you're drinking sake is how the sake is dispersed on your palate. Um, if you have uh, things with a uh, very soft, gentle lip, the sake can roll very gently on your palate. If it's a sharper edge, it, it might go in a different way. So it it, it it does place the sake on your palate in different ways, the different types of vessels, but I don't think there's any clear answer one way or the other 
no rules. It's all about enjoyment and experimentation. And I think for many people who get into sake and start bringing sake into their home and drinking sake at home is to find a trusty everyday sake cup that brings you a lot of joy. And that will bring joy to that experience. OK, how about right here? Yes. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. This is somewhat of a follow-up to that, I guess. Uh, with the wooden masu, you were talking about how uh, there were uh, essential oils or uh, fragrant woods that are used. Mm -hmm. I was wondering how that affected the experience of tasting and smelling the sake, and if um, counterintuitively it, it, it's, it, it seems that you would want to use something neutral to get the most out of the experience of the sake itself. Right. When masu were originally used as drinking vessels regularly, sake was also produced in wooden barrels and it was shipped in wooden barrels. So there was already a lot of these oils and uh, sugi or hinoki flavors coming into the sake. They were woody to begin with. So drinking out of a wooden cup on top of that was not that big a deal. But as they moved to stainless steel tanks and uh, more uh, glass shipping containers, uh, glass bottles for shipping the sake, using wood would definitely influence that taste. So in the modern situation that we have now, using a freshly cut uh, wooden masu is going to affect the flavor of whatever sake you put in there. As you use a, a masu over and over again, those uh, oils wear away and it becomes more neutral, but I would definitely recommend any premium sakes that you want to drink not to enjoy them out of a freshly cut wooden masu. Uh, that will affect the flavor of premium sake. They do make masu, as I showed you, out of different um, materials, and you can get them also made out of plastic, out of lacquer, um, out of glass. So there's, there's different ways you can enjoy it on a neutral surface and still have the fun of drinking out of the cup. I see. Yeah. yeah the, right. There's a type of sake, almost a historical type of sake, um, which is aged in a cedar barrel. And that type of sake um, is, uh, would be very, very good to drink out of um, that type of masu. So they do make cedar barrel aged sake nowadays. It's a little bit rare, and it has a very uh, rustic, uh, woody taste to it. But that's the ideal sake to drink from a wooden masu. So there is, there is a match for that, for sure. OK. Let's go right here. Yes. In the middle there. Yep. <clears throat> Hi, Tim. Thank you. So kind of piggybacking on the last two questions, uh, I know you can enjoy sake out of of a glass, like a wine glass. Um, and I've heard that the shape of that glass kind of influences also the, the taste. So how do you know what type of glass to use, kind of like the way Belgian beers are poured into different shaped glasses? Mm -hmm. um, you, I left wine glasses and non-traditional glasses out of this lecture on purpose. We only had 30 minutes to talk about. I really wanted to introduce kind of the core vessels that were available uh, that are really represent what I think is Japanese sake vessels. So I focused more on that. We can uh, talk about Western vessels at another lecture, maybe next year. And um, uh, I, I think that uh, there are different types of glasses for different beer, how much do they really affect your enjoyment of it? How much is marketing or, you know, that's a really important question, I think. Uh, my focus really is on if I'm using a wine glass, getting a wine glass that I really love and uh, not overthinking it too much. I don't like to make things too complicated that you have to use this type of wine glass with Daiginjo and this type of glass with Junmai Daiginjo. I think that's a little bit over, over complicated. So if you have a white wine glass that you like, you're enjoying drinking out of it, you can get the aroma nicely. It has a beautiful handle. It feels good in your hand. Those things are much more important to me than the actual shape or you know some type of pre-prescribed glass for a certain sake. Let's try right here. Yes, right here. 
Um, it is my understanding that sake should not be really aged for too long, unlike wine. How long did the sake usually stay fresh in a bottle, you know, usual bottle feature? And what would be the ideal storage temperature? Well, there are some sakes that are aged on purpose. Uh, that's called koshu, or it's an aged sake, aged on purpose sake. And I think it makes up uh, just about 1% of all the sake sold is in this koshu category or aged category. Uh, but the majority of sakes are not meant to be aged and should be consumed young and fresh. The most uh, important among those for drinking young and fresh is what we call nama sake or unpasteurized sake. Those should be consumed right away. Most sake that you uh, make, the uh, average sake, would be aged for three to six months after fermentation and then bottled and shipped. Sake is meant to be consumed young, uh, even if it's been pasteurized. You should drink it as soon as possible in most cases. And once you receive a bottle at home, I, my rule of thumb is to say, generally, you want to drink that within one year. But most sake doesn't last that long in my house. So um, <laughs> that's, that's very much theoretical. But uh, uh, if, if, you're, if you get a, I, I can't tell you how often I go to events and people come up to me. I just did a food and wine festival in Atlanta. People came up to me several times and they're like, oh, I have a bottle of sake in my closet that someone brought back from Japan. 10 years ago, and should I drink it? And, and people don't realize that you know, it it's, uh, needs to be consumed young and fresh. So my words of wisdom for sake consumption are carpe diem. <laughs> Seize the day, yes. OK, we have, we have time for one last question. And let's go right here, this gentleman right here. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Tim. Um, just sticking to the theme of the day on vessels, uh, at several places in Tokyo, I've been served sake where they actually put a glass inside the yes. masu. Yes. And then they <clears throat> fill the glass, and yes. then it sort of spills over into the masu. Is that a modern Western gimmick, or is there <laughs> any history in that that somehow relates to the traditional vessels? So. Well, that's, I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, that was an oversight in my lecture that I didn't bring that up. Uh, the overpour is something that you may have seen in a Japanese restaurant where they take a wooden masu and they'll put some type of glass in there. They'll pour into the glass and then it will spill over into the masu itself. And this type of overpour is something that I have heard was the invention of advertising executives in the Mad Men era of Japan. They, so uh, I don't think it's a long-standing uh, samurai tradition dating back 500 years. But um, it is very uh, charming and very, um, very lovely because the, the meaning behind it really is that we're giving you literally more than you paid for. We're literally overflowing your cup. Uh, it can be a little bit confusing how to drink it. And I remember the first time it happened to me, I was like, whoa, 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 you're spilling. But um, what, what I recommend you do is if you have the masu and you have your cup in here and there's sake in there and sake in here, I usually pick up the masu and drink enough out of this without with dripping in here and then pour, it, pour this back in here and then drink everything out of this. So that's really the, the way to do it. Um, but that's a great question, and I'm glad you brought that up. I think it's a wonderful, I think it's a wonderful custom and uh, really a wonderful way to present sake to customers. So that brings us to the end of our questions. Thank you all so much. And let's go enjoy some sake together. Thank you very much.